All right. It's probably going to be the last week of the, uh, the prophecy series that we've been doing. Um, I haven't really found much else that I really want to teach on just in general. I mean, there, there's more things I could preach on, but um, we're kind of coming to an end. I might do one more next week, but I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. I, I might hit a few issues that are relevant to end times prophecy, like who the elect are and some things like that. But um, for the most part, we're probably going to be wrapping up this evening with the, with the prophecy stuff. We're going to be hitting Revelation up. But um, what I'm going to be preaching on tonight is the unholy trinity. Okay, we're preaching. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into the Antichrist and Satan and the false prophet. And, and really, so we started off here in Isaiah 14. I want you to look back here at verse number 12 because we're going to see an attribute of Satan. We're going to see something about Satan that, that kind of defines who he is and the way that he operates. Look at verse number 12 here in Isaiah 14. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did, didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. One of the, the, the big things about Satan, one of, the, one of the main attributes of Satan is his pride and his desire to be like God. Doesn't say he wants to replace God. He said he wants to be just like God. And you can see in everything that he does, and we're going to see tonight in the prophecy of end times events, how Satan is literally going to be trying to mimic and, and do the things that Jesus Christ has already done or Jesus Christ is going to do and try to be the fulfillment of the prophecy himself personally so that he could be the one that's worshipped, so that he wants to make a name that's above every name. He wants to get everything that Jesus deserves, that God gets, and he wants to elevate himself up to the heavens and up to just so he can be just like God. Because God's the one who gets all the worship in heaven. God's the one who's sitting on the throne. God's the one who gets all the glory. God's, you know, God is the focus of everything. Satan wants to be the center of attention. He wants to have the worship. He wants to have the focus. And this is, this is, you know, is going to define the theme. So what I'm going to be doing is we're going to be going through Scripture. Turn, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be going through a lot of the end time stuff and just noting what Satan plans on doing and how it corresponds to prophecy of Jesus Christ, right? Of, of, of these various things and the things that he's going to be doing to counterfeit who, you know, Jesus Christ. Because that's when he comes, he's going to say that he is God. He's basically going to be claiming to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in so many areas, and we could even look at other areas. We're not going to do it. I'm, going to be, I'm focusing mostly just on the end time stuff. But Satan is always trying to get people to worship him and he's constantly trying to mimic Jesus Christ. And honestly, it's important to understand this about Satan because like any master counterfeiter, the way that you're going to fool people is to make it look as close to the true whatever you're trying to counterfeit as possible. Right? So like if you're trying to counterfeit money, if you, if you gave someone at the store like monopoly money, like literal monopoly money, no one's going to be able, no one's going to accept that and be like, oh, okay, $500, here's your change, sir. You know, as you gave them that orange $500 bill from monopoly, it's, 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 it's a joke, right? People are going to laugh at you. But they do make bills, $100 bills, $20, whatever. I mean, that, that look, that are masterfully created and they look, I mean, really close, really easy to be deceived by them. Because people spend a lot of time and energy into creating these counterfeit bills because they could print money out of thin air just like the government does. And the government doesn't like having competition. They want to be the only ones being able to do that. So that's why it's a crime. But a counterfeiter, right, whether you're counterfeiting checks, well, no matter what you're counterfeiting, 
In order to pass it off and get people to believe, you're going to have to make it look as close as possible to the original. So that's why Satan's plan is to make himself look as close as possible to Jesus Christ with a perversion to it. There has to always be a perversion because he's not Jesus Christ. He's always twisting the truth. He's always taking God's word and just slanting it enough to be a lie. Just enough to be not true. In Matthew chapter 4, we're going to see here, the, uh, this is of course a story of Jesus Christ when he's in the desert, he's in the wilderness, and Satan comes and he tries to attempt him. And um, we see that the goal of Satan is, is how much he just really wants people to worship him. Look at verse number 8 of Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan knows that. Satan knows that God is the only one that's supposed to be getting worshipped, but he wants to be just like God. And what a better way than for him to get the Son of God to bow down and worship him. See, Satan doesn't care. He doesn't care that much, even though he has the kingdoms of the world and the glory to do what he will with. Even though he has this influence and this power on this earth to do many things, he doesn't care about that. What he cares about is being like the Most High. That is his driving force. That is what he really is after. He's after the fame, the glory. He's after the, the, the people worshiping him. Obviously, it didn't work with Jesus Christ, but he's going to fool a lot of people. Satan will mimic everything about God. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, we're going to see here, I'm not going to read a whole lot of this chapter, but it's a, it's a very concise um, portion of Scripture that outlines the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. When you're reading through this, you've got to be careful because there's a lot of beasts that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. You know, symbolically, there's beasts that are, you know, the, the great whore is riding on a beast. The Antichrist is referred to as a beast. And I think even Satan might be referred to as a beast. So like when you're, when you're going through this, it, it might get a little bit confusing if you're not being real careful to... to, to Make sure you know what you're, you're reading about, what's being referenced in which section. But, um, oh, I think even the false prophet is referred to as a beast. Let's look at, look at verse number 13 here, though. Of, uh, because a beast is just like an animal. I mean, it's, it's, it's a being, right? It's, it's, we would consider any animal on this earth you could call a beast. It's a generic term for, for, for a being, you know? And... Um, but we're going to see here very clearly delineated into three parts. Verse number 13 of chapter 16 reads, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the, the unholy trinity here is the, the dragon, which is Satan. Satan's always referred to as the dragon, right? When, when it's referring to anything, that's Satan. The, the beast it's referring to here is the Antichrist. And then the false prophet, though, in this trinity is, more, is kind of like a John the Baptist type of figure, but one that can um, perform some miracles. As it says here in verse number 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle that great day of God Almighty. So just like you know, when Jesus Christ came on the scene, he had a prophet pointing people to him. John the Baptist. He had the voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight, you know, the paths and, and just pointing people out. Say, hey, here's the Lamb of God. Follow him. Follow him. That's the Son of God. This is the Christ. Right? Well, the devil's going to have someone doing that for him. Right. And the same way that Jesus is basically empowered by God, the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan. And he, he's doing this, and it's, it's just a, a total mimicry of, of what God has already done, and even of the Trinity in a way of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? So it's kind of like an amalgamation here, the way that the Satan's doing it. But um, 
they're going to have these powers to perform miracles. Again, when G you know, John the Baptist didn't perform miracles, he just preached the word. You know, he didn't do anything um, miraculous. He didn't do anything. God didn't empower him in that way. But he was, you know, basically the greatest man that ever walked this earth other than Jesus Christ at that time. I mean, he was, among them are born of women and are not risen a greater than John the Baptist, the Bible says. He didn't need to do the miracles. He did the work. But um, the devil's unholy trinity, they are going to be doing miracles. And I'll just quote this for you in Matthew 24. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the power that Satan has to perform miracles is going to be extremely convincing for the people of this earth. I mean, think about how convincing the miracles were when Jesus walked this earth. He healed people, he raised the dead, he did all these things. Now, I don't necessarily think that the, the, the devil's miracles are going to be of a good variety. They may be, but I think it's going to be more of a demonstration of power. When we see the devil's power in the, in the Bible, I think what, the first thing that comes to my mind is the book of Job. Remember how he attacked Job. He had power to do a lot of various things. He had power to rain fire and brimstone basically down out of heaven to destroy, um, I don't know if it was his fields or his, uh, his um, animals, whatever. There's, there's a few things they did. He caused a whirlwind to come, right? So he had some type of power over some weather and the fire and brimstone to come down from heaven. These are things that Satan had power to do. And they were supernatural things. And see, they're, they're strong enough to, to think that God's doing this. It wasn't God, it was Satan. Satan has the power to do these things. And these are the types of things that I believe he's going to be doing on this earth are these types of miracles. I mean, he, he's even able to perform a miracle with Jesus where when he brought him up on that high mountain to show him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Right? I mean, he was able to show him those things. Satan is very, has a lot of power. God has granted him a lot of power to be able to use. And Another interesting thing about seven is Satan, and we didn't we read the entire chapter of Isaiah 14, but what it says is that when he gets to hell, people are gonna be narrowly looking upon him like you're the one. Wait, you're the one that caused all this fear in the world? You're the one that we're all afraid of? You're the one that caused all this destruction? You know why they're gonna be saying that? It's because I think Satan's gonna be little, this small wimp of a creature looking, you know, like when you actually see him for who he is. He's going to be like, why was anybody ever afraid of you? Because what he does is he builds up a big facade. He's got this great image that he wants to project, this fear, and he could use this power and he could use all of these other things to instill fear into people. But he himself is just really not that much to be afraid of at all. And that's what we get from Scripture. I mean, Scripture tells us that, that people are going to be like, why, why were we ever afraid of you? Turn, if you would, to uh, Revelation 13. Just back a couple pages there. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, we're going to read a little bit about the Antichrist here. Revelation 13, verse number 3, the Bible says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. I think that this is referring to an actual event that's going to happen where the Antichrist receives literally like a wound to his head. Now again, when you're reading Revelation 13, you're going to read about various heads and there's heads of a beast and they have different meanings and, you know, and the horns and everything else. But when we get to this point, and it's talking about this deadly wound that's healed and all the world's going to wonder at this. I don't think this is just talking about some, some uh, reference to like the Ottoman Empire or some kingdom, some nation that has been destroyed in the past and now is all of a sudden going to resurface that everyone's going to wonder at. 
I think this is talking about another example of the devil trying to um, duplicate or mimic Jesus Christ, right, or through the Antichrist, receiving a deadly wound, just like Jesus was crucified and died on the cross, and then three days later he rose again from the dead. I believe this is Satan, you know, through the Antichrist, performing that same type of event where he's going to die and then somehow be brought back to life. And everyone's going to wonder at that. Everyone's going to see that and be like, wow, how could that happen? And be amazed by that. And that might be the very moment. I mean, the devil might actually take over, you know, and again, that's, I'm not dogmatic about that belief, but um, that's where I think might actually happen is that he kind of possesses then that vessel because you know, the Antichrist being an actual person, you know, when someone dies, they're dead. I don't believe that the devil has power to um, bring back life. However, he's going to at least stage that event to make it look like, or, you know, or someone's coming back from death. His deadly wound is healed. He's going to come back to life, and all the people are going to see that. And it's going to be another one of those lying wonders and miracles that deceives almost everybody. And it's going to be so powerful, the Bible says that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. I mean, those of us that are saved, we'd look at that and go, wow, I have no explanation for that. That must be God, except we won't be deceived. Because we have the, we have the Holy Ghost residing inside of us that's going to help us discern truth from fiction. It's going to help us understand, no, wait a minute, something's going to be blaring at us going, this is fake, this is the Antichrist, this is not Jesus Christ. I mean, we have enough written in Scripture to tell us that, of what to expect next, of who to expect to come, that we know the Antichrist is going to come. And Jesus Christ himself said, you know, when they tell you, lo, Christ is here, or lo, he's there, believe him not. Like, don't believe him. It doesn't matter what signs and wonders and everything else that they're doing. Jesus already told us that these wonders are going to happen. Don't be deceived by it. He's saying, because when the Son of Man comes, he says, the lightning shines from the east and goes all the way to the west. He says, so is the, 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 like the coming of the Son of Man. Every eye is going to see him. There's going to be no mistake in this. When Jesus Christ comes back, it's, it's undoubtable. It's, it's just, yep, there's Jesus Christ. Everyone will know about it. It will be a sure thing. It's not a, well, there's someone over here doing you know, these miracles and this stuff. Nope, that's not, that's not the return of Jesus Christ. So we don't need to be deceived by that. So he has a deadly wound that's healed. Revelation 13, let's keep reading here. Verse number four, the Bible says, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So again, you know, this, like, this concept that the beast might be some other nation or something like that is saying, who's gonna make war with him? It's a person. Who's gonna make war with him? Why? Because the beast received a wound unto death and is now alive again. Well, how do you kill somebody? How do you win a war against someone that if they die, they're just going to come right back up, right back to life? Right? I mean, it's just kind of like, who's, who's going to fight against this? And they're already worshiping the dragon, they're worshiping the devil, and they're worshiping the Antichrist. Verse number five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Who? That beast that had the wound that was, that was healed. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And again, this language lines up exactly with Daniel when it talks about the, the Antichrist who's in power that speaks great lying wonders and blasphemies. I mean, it's, and it lines up with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It lines up with everything you know, because I've, I've heard just recently, I've been reading some stuff and what, what other people, I, I, like, I love to hear other opinions on the Bible, especially on prophecy. It's interesting, but, you know, people are trying to explain that the Babylon's going to be the Muslims or the Ottoman Empire or something like that. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I have not read like all into it to see everything they're saying, but the little bit that I've heard I'm just thinking, that's a stretch. The, again, it's just like so many other things. You're, you're taking bits and pieces and trying to apply way more to it that, that doesn't actually fit what is being said here. You want to take some of the parts of the Bible that are trying to be um, symbolic, right, and some of the references of the beasts, 
but you're not just sticking with all of the explanations giving with the sim symbolism. I mean, it tells you specifically what the horns mean. It tells you what the heads, you know. And the only thing that you could be confused with, and that's why I mentioned it, is that, well, the use of the word beast is used multiple places, and it doesn't always carry the same exact meaning. It's just a beast. If you see something that looks like a beast, well, that beast may be representative of something else. So a beast that, that's like a leopard or like a bear and like a lion, those are symbolic and representing something. But they're still, it's still a beast. But then referring to the Antichrist, a person as being a beast is a different thing. It's a different usage of the word beast. And you understand it just by the context. What's it talking about? And you compare scripture with scripture. So we could see here, and that's, that was one of the things I read. Like I said, I didn't get too deep into it, but all these red flags are popping up. While I'm reading it's like, that's not, you know, that's, that doesn't make any sense. So that's why I'm kind of bringing this up now. But anyways, let's keep reading here. Because I, I don't want to just get off on some other theory that, I mean, I, I could preach an entire sermon about that if I want to. Um, we're focused more tonight on Satan, the unholy trinity, and the things that he does to try to mimic Jesus Christ and God and the Holy, Holy Ghost. So let's keep reading here. It says in verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So he's going to have, he's going to be accomplishing his goal of getting people to worship him as God. Turn, if you would, to Malachi chapter 4. And keep a finger here in Revelation 13. Sorry, we're not done in Revelation 13 yet. So if you've already gotten away from it, keep a, keep a bookmarker there. We're going to be going back to Revelation quite a bit. But in Revelation 13, the, part, the portion we just read there, verses 3 through 8, is overall this, this description of the Antichrist, right? He has a deadly wound, it's healed. Um, just like Jesus Christ was put to death and resurrected from the dead, mimicking Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look a little bit about the false prophet, which is basically a John the Baptist, as I mentioned before, for the devil, for the Antichrist. And I believe, see, the other thing I think is going to happen is that Satan is going to be using Scripture. He's going to be using the Bible to prop himself up, to claim to be the second coming of Jesus Christ, to claim to be the, the, the Messiahs of all the religions of the world. And at the end of the sermon, I'm going to just share with you some of the eschatology or end times events of various world religions, of main major world religions today, and what they're expecting to happen in the end times. And you'll see how Satan is going to fit into everything, all of their beliefs of end times events. It's amazing. I mean, it, really, it truly is incredible. The, the, the world that we live in, that, these, that all these various religions are having a form of the truth in the sense that, which, I mean, it makes sense. I believe Satan is the founder of all these false religions anyways because his goal is to get people to worship him. So any way he can do that, it doesn't matter to him if it's through some fake idols. He, I mean, he could come up with every other way to worship him because God has one way to worship him. He's like, well, I'll take every other way and they could all worship me. And that's what he's done. And so he has varying religions that are maybe very different from one another, all the same in that they don't accept Christ as their savior, of course, but varying in the, you know, between Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, Islam and, you know, um, uh, Catholicism and whatever. I mean, name, name the false religion. And he's got all kinds of different methods to draw people in to get them to worship him. And since he's come up with all these various religions, he's worked it into their doctrine to look for his coming because he wants everybody to worship him. He is a, what is a universalist, right? The, whoever you talk to today, the, the, the Unitarian universalist. I mean, that is just saying nothing other than I'm a Satan worshiper because Satan's going to be the one that comes to unite all the world's religions to follow him. 
Because he comes before Jesus comes. Because the prophecy is that when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. And everyone's going to worship Jesus. And there's going to be peace on earth. But see, the devil wants to do that first. Because he knows that that's going to happen. So he's, he's going to try to prevent that and come first and say, oh, no, no, I'm the second coming of Jesus. I'm going to provide peace. Everybody look to me and worship me. I'm God. It's a brilliant plan to use what's already been written in the word of God that, that true believers and children of God are following to try to deceive everybody else and deceive the whole world into thinking that he's really God. Malachi chapter 4. So we're going to see here the false prophet, right? This is, this, is, this is the scriptural forecoming of Elijah the prophet, the foretelling, the prophecy. Verse number 5, Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So I believe that this false prophet that's going to come and point everybody to the Antichrist is probably going to claim to be Elijah the prophet. And he's going to have some signs and, and miracles that we know that he's going to be able to do and probably will call fire down from heaven just like Elijah did. And see, see, he's working under the power of Elijah instead of the power of Satan and try to reproduce and say, see, this is, this is the unfolding of Scripture. Now, I don't know enough about the other, you know, about, about false religion. I don't know enough about, like, I didn't, I've never read all the way through the Koran. You know, I've looked enough into it to decide that I knew it wasn't true back when I was seeking for God, but I've never read the entire thing cover to cover. I don't know all of the end times of everything else. I did a little bit of research and I just, just to sh because I thought it was really interesting how the Antichrist lines up with their beliefs. But um, there may be other places where the false prophet and these things are going to be fulfilling other religions, right? But I know the Bible and I can see exactly what he's trying to do. And I know that God's word is truth. And this is ultimately what he's concerned with is making himself fit into, the, into God's word and making everything about him. Now, we know that um, John the Baptist was, I mean, Jesus Christ already said that Elijah has come first, and he said that was John the Baptist. I also believe, though, even though, G and I believe that 100% to be true, I think that there's also going to be an Elijah, if you will, before the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's my personal belief. You know, I mean, if you don't believe that, that's fine, whatever. I just see a verse like this that talks about the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, that that hasn't happened yet. The great and dreadful day of the Lord has not happened yet. Now, you can say Elijah the prophet did come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord because if it's through John the Baptist, well, that was before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But I think because there's going to be um, exploits being done by the believers, there's going to be this resurgence, I think, of people who are really standing strong for the word of God and, and saints are going to be martyred and standing up for the cause of Christ that there's going to be a leading and directing from an Elijah-like person kind of leading the charge for the saints. That's my personal belief. But um, anyhow, I believe that the false prophet now is going to be taking on this role and the devil is probably going to be using scriptures like this to say, see, this is Elijah when it's really the false prophet. Turn back, if you would, to Revelation 13. So remember in, in Revelation 13, we saw the, the description of the Antichrist uh, as a beast, having his head wounded as it were to death and then coming back to life and people worshiping the beast and worshiping the dragon. And now we're going to continue reading here in verse number 11. We're going to see another beast. So verse 11 says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Okay, so this is not the Antichrist because it's another one, it's a different one. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we see here 
this next beast that's coming up is pointing everybody saying, see, worship the beast, worship that guy, worship the antichrist whose deadly wound was healed. That's who you need to be worshiping. This is the exercise of the false prophet. This is this other beast, verse number 13. And he doeth great wonders, look at this, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That is exactly what Elijah did. It is no surprise that the false prophet is going to be doing the same exact miracle that Elijah did in order to mimic and to take the place of and to claim to be, oh yeah, I'm Elijah the prophet. And I'm pointing you to the Christ who's really the Antichrist. Verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, when it says here he gave power to give life unto the image of the beast, I don't think this is talking about like a soul. It's talking about an image, right? An, an inanimate object that was created, but given the ability to speak and to, and, to, and to act like it's a being. Which, again, with, I think with the technology the way it is today, it's not that hard to deceive people into thinking like, oh yeah, this is... So giving life is like he's animating it, right? He's, he's, he's making it appear to be alive and everything else through lying signs and wonders. It's not that he's creating literal life but the language being used here, giving it life, means, yeah, it's going to be able to speak. It's going to be able to, to do some things that people are going to be like, wow, it's amazing. This image is, is brought to life. And again, it's, it's designed just to fool the people so that way, oh, all these things are happening and now this image is speaking and proclaiming people need to be put to death if you're not going to worship me. Well, that's what the image said, so let's go out and do it. I mean, that's what people are going to be doing. And that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we could know this isn't God. God doesn't set up images for people to worship, ever. God doesn't operate, not even for himself. He doesn't set up an image and saying, this is the image that you need to worship for me. It's part of the Ten Commandments. But so many people don't know God, they don't know the Bible, they don't, you know, a, a lot of I think a lot of people at this point hate God anyways. So they'll be all over this other religion because it's going to speak to them. Flip over if you would to, um, actually, no, stay here. Stay here in Revelation 13. I'm going to read from Revelation 22 for you because In Revelation 22, we're going to see God providing a mark in our foreheads. This is, but this happens after the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation 22. With the new heaven and new earth, Revelation 22, 3 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. This is prophecy in Scripture of God putting his name in our foreheads. You're in Revelation 13. Revelation 13 talks about the mark of the beast. Again, Satan trying to duplicate and counterfeit everything that God does and that Jesus does so that he can be accepted. And he'll, I'm sure he'll be using Revelation 22 and actually Ezekiel chapter 9 probably even more. We're going to turn to that next. So if you want to get finger ready for Ezekiel chapter 9. In Revelation 13, we're going to see the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So he says, okay, you're going to need to get a mark. But what is that mark? It says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Six, six, six. That's the mark of the beast. So there's a mark. He says you need to either have the mark or the name or the number. So he gives you more options. God says he's going to write his name on our foreheads, but he's saying, you know what? 
you can have my, you're gonna have my name on your forehead, or you can just take this symbol, this, this mark that represents me, or the number of my name, right, which is 666. And again, I don't have the full, complete understanding of what that means, the 666, but uh, I'm sure it's going to come clear as the time approaches. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 9, because I think this scripture is going to be used by the Antichrist as his justification. Not just Revelation 22. Ezekiel chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in, and stood beside the brazen altar, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Before I go any further, notice what's being done here. This is directions given by God in Ezekiel 9, saying, Okay, put a mark on the foreheads of certain people. And as soon as they're done placing that mark, I'm going to send another group of people in to start killing them. And he's saying, don't let your eyes spare and don't have pity. I believe this is exactly what Satan's going to be doing, the Antichrist is going to be doing, when he calls for everyone to have the mark of the beast in their forehead, and he's making war against the saints, and he's saying, look, anyone who doesn't have my mark, you're going to need to go through, don't have pity, don't spare, and you kill him. Look what it, keeps, it says here, verse number um, 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house. And fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth, and they went forth and slew in the city. Do you see how this can completely be used by Satan to justify the mark of the beast and killing those who don't have the mark? After he's done enough lying signs and wonders to convince the people, he's just gonna it's gonna be like, well, see, here's what we have to do. This is what, what God wants us to do. This is what I want you to do. We're fulfilling this prophecy right now. And people are going to be thinking they do God service. That are going to be carrying out the plan of the Antichrist. Why? Because they're going to see it. Oh, this has been in Scripture. It's right there. Obviously completely perverting and changing what this is talking about, but he's going to use it for his advantage. He's going to use people ignorance of the Bible just to say, and people who are un you know, unbelievers... They don't understand the Bible anyways. Their heart's blinded. But the elect, we're not going to be deceived. We're going to see him misusing and abusing the scripture to, to his advantage. Turn, if you would, to um, Daniel chapter 11. I have in my notes here that deadly wound is healed. That's mimicking the resurrection. I already went over that. And then in Daniel 11, we're going to see the Antichrist making himself God on earth. Why? Because he wants the attention. He's, he's doing all these various things to duplicate what God is going to do. But he's trying to get to it first. We know that Jesus Christ is going to come and reign for a thousand years. And then God is going to reign and his throne is literally going to be among us on, at the new heaven and new earth. Daniel 11, verse number 36, the Bible reads, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, 
and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. That God of forces is Satan. Because this is the Antichrist going to lift up himself above every god and he's going to honor Satan who's giving him his power and the power from the, from the dragon. Turn back, well, turn if you would to 2 Thessalonians 2. I know we're jumping around quite a bit, but I just think, I just think this stuff is kind of amazing how, how well planned Satan has everything and, and, and how he's going to really try to cement his, his, his coming. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting because it's like, he, but he knows the way things are going to end. So it's, 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 a, it's a bizarre event. Like it, you, you wonder almost like, what's he thinking? He knows what the end is, yet he's still playing everything out. I, I don't know. I don't get it. Maybe, maybe Satan just doesn't know because, again, it's just like a lost person. It's just completely... A mystery to him. I don't know. It, it almost just seems just, a, just an exercise in futility. But the way everything plays out, it's, it's almost like he honestly believes he's going to be able to overthrow Jesus and overthrow God. And get, if he gets enough people behind him, he can do this. I don't know. Pride. It's pride. Exactly. He's blinded by his pride. That's probably what it is. He's so lifted up in himself that he thinks that I can actually do this. I'm better than I'm better than God. I'm gonna I'm gonna find a way to, to do this. You get delusional. Second yeah, right. Thessalonians two, look at verse number three. The Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This lines up exactly with what we just read in Daniel 11. Talking about the Antichrist. He'll be sitting in the temple of God saying, I'm God. Worship me. I am the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then jump down to verse number eight. It says, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Turn back, if you would, now to Revelation 19. It's the last point I'm going to make about, um, one of, about the similarities that I've seen that Satan's going to you know, counterfeit the, the true prophecy in Jesus Christ and everything else. We're going to see here in Revelation 19 the actual, the prophecy of Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, 11, where we see Jesus Christ comes on a white horse at the Battle of Armageddon. You remember the Battle of Armageddon takes place after God's poured out his wrath and the devil gathers up his armies to fight against God, right? But then Jesus Christ comes and this is when Jesus Christ is coming to set up his kingdom on this earth to set up his millennial reign. Verse number 11, Revelation 19 says, and I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, obviously talking about Jesus Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords. Now flip back if you would to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 is the, is the beginning of the opening of the seals. Revelation 6 is not God pouring out his wrath. It's just the beginning of the seals being opened which is the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week of that seven-year period. 
because this is when the Antichrist gets, comes on the scene, basically. Revelation 6, verse 1, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's exactly, you know, and I'm not going to go through this because a couple weeks ago when we did the, the study mostly through the book of Daniel, we really got, got into those scriptures and, and got in a lot more in depth about how the Antichrist is going to be having these wars. You have the king of the north and the king of the south, and they're going to be having the battles, and he's going to be conquering all the way up until the point where you have the ten kings giving up their kingdom to him you know, and giving all power unto the Antichrist to have this whole new world order, one government system. But prior to that, he's going to be conquering and, con you know, going forth to conquer and, and um, you know, basically take over. So he's going to be doing these, these great wars and these exploits. And um, he's going to come and unite all religions and destroys the, destroy those that will not convert. That's why he's saying... You're going to get the mark of the beast. You know, who has, you know, if you don't worship the image, if you don't fall down and worship the beast and take his mark, then you're going to be killed. Now, all of the, you know, people will say, well, how can you unite all the religions of the world? Don't know, isn't there always fighting between the religions? I mean, isn't there always, you know, conflict and stuff? Well, the way he's going to do that is, as I mentioned earlier, he's going to be the one that they're looking for. He's going to be the first coming of the Messiah for the Jews that don't believe in Jesus Christ, for the Jews who are looking for Messiah to come. He's going to be the last imam to come for the Muslims, for Islam. He's going to be the one who's going to fulfill this prophet role. He's going to be the um, Krishna, the, like the second coming of Krishna for the Hindus. It's a different name. It's like Kalik or something. I don't remember exactly. I have it written here. I'm going to read them for you. He's going to be the second coming, essentially, of Buddha. He's going to be all of these people to the various religions because this is who they're looking for. This is how he's going to unite the world. He's going to offer peace and say, put me in charge. You know, we'll make worldwide peace here. People are going to be deceived into thinking this is God on earth. One, because of the miracles. Two, because he's going to be fulfilling prophecies left and right through these religions that he's created. And he's mimicking the Bible. He's mimicking Jesus Christ. He's counterfeiting. So all of these main religions have some type of a, of a savior figure that they're expecting. Now look, they all have their own nuances. They all have their own, you know, details. And I am going, I'm way far from providing everything. There's different sects, there's different beliefs, you know, so don't give me any flag for, well, that's not what this sect of Judaism believes or whatever, okay? It doesn't matter because when he comes, he's going to deceive everyone anyways, but I just thought that the similarities here and the things that, um, that, that he's going to fulfill, the Antichrist, is you can, you can see how it's going to affect the world. Because think about it, if there's different sects, let's say you have, within Judaism, you've got conservative, you've got orthodox, you've got Hasidic, you've got, you know, all these various brands, you've got what, I don't remember what the more liberal ones are, you know, all these various shades of Judaism, right? Well, what's going to happen is when he comes on the scene, it's not going to be that far of a stretch for them to say, oh, well, we were wrong about this. Okay, they were right about these end times events and just, just go with it because he's going to fulfill whatever, you know, whatever one of the scriptures. Even within Christianity, those that are not saved, that, um, oh, well, the pre-tribulation rapture was true because here he is. Here's Jesus on the scene. I guess these other guys were wrong. Well, we'll, we'll go with that. Right? I mean, whatever. There's, there's so many different things. So, um, I'm just gonna, I, I don't even have all the sources cited here. I, I kind of, I went online and I was, I was looking, I was trying to find as much of a, re, a legitimate source as I could. I mean, people who, not Christian sources citing 
Judaism or whatever, but actually going to like Jewish sources, going to Hindu sources, going, you know, because, you know, I've heard different things, but I'm not going to repeat something that I've heard without verifying it for myself. I've heard various applications of, and I'm not saying they're not true, but what I'm going to be providing to you is the, to the best of my ability, what I could find about what these people believe. Because this is, this is what I've been able to come up with. But um, regardless, it's, it's all very interesting. So I'm going to read here some sources. Um, and sorry for not citing them. It's in my Google history, I'm sure. Uh, this is, and this is who the Jews are looking for. Now the Bible itself says, you know, someone who, who comes in his own name, him ye shall receive. Jesus said that, you know, if someone comes in the Lord's name, you're not going to receive him. But if someone comes in his own name, him ye shall receive. And the Antichrist is going to come in his own name because he's going to be claimed to be God. He's going to sit in the temple of God claiming to be God. And I don't think he's going to take the name of Jesus. I think he's going to take some other name. So here's, here's a little bit why I've copied and pasted. It says that, um, this one source says, before the time of the Mashiach, which is Messiah, uh, there shall be war and suffering. The Mashiach will bring about the political and spiritual redemption of the Jewish people by bringing us back to Israel and restoring Jerusalem. He will establish a government in Israel that will be the center of all world government, both for Jews and Gentiles. He will rebuild the temple and reestablish its worship. He will restore the religious court system of Israel and establish Jewish law as a law of the land. Interesting, it mentions the rebuilding of the temple and the reestablishment of the animal sacrifices because that we know that those things are going to be happening up until the abomination of desolation, which is that image that's going to be placed in the temple of God. So in order for the temple of God to be there, it needs to be rebuilt because it's not there now. And in order for the, the daily sacrifice to cease, it needs to be reinstituted. Well, the person doing all of that, the Jews say that that's going to be the Messiah. So who are they looking for? The Antichrist. Because that's who's going to do these things. According to Scripture, according to the Bible, that is what's going to happen. But they're looking for the Antichrist to be their Savior, their Mashiach, their Messiah. Another source said when the Messiah does come, he will inaugurate the Messianic Age. Um, the Tanakh employs the following descriptions about this period. Peace among all nations, perfect harmony and abundance in nature. Um, all Jews return from exile to Israel. Universal acceptance, universal acceptance of the Jewish God and Jewish, re Jewish religion. No sin or evil. All Israel will obey the commandments. Reinstatement of the temple. And then, and then I have another source here. It says, Orthodox views have generally held that the Messiah will be descended from his father through the line of King David and will gather the Jews back into the land of Israel, usher in an era of peace, build the third temple, father a male heir, reinstitute the Sanhedrin, and so on. Jewish tradition alludes to two redeemers, both of whom are called Mashiach and are involved in ushering in the Messianic age. Uh, it says, in general, the term Messiah uh, unqualified refers to Mashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David. That's what the Jews are looking for. According to their faith, according to their sources, this is what I got. And it's a, the, the, the similarities are astounding. It's like, that's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen, except from the Antichrist. The Muslims, they're looking for their Imam Mahdi. I'll read from these sources for you. In Islamic eschatology, the Mahdi is the prophesied redeemer of Islam who will rule for five, seven, nine, or 19 years according to differing interpretations. Um, many of them that I saw were seven years, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, so, okay, there's these variations. It says, before the day of judgment and will rid the world of evil. There is no explicit reference to the Mahdi in the Quran, but references to him are found in Hadith, uh, the reports and traditions of Muhammad's teachings collected after his death. According to Islamic tradition, the Mahdi's tenure will coincide with the second coming of Jesus Christ, who is to assist the Mahdi against the Masiyah Dajjal, literally the false Messiah or Antichrist. So they have a version of the, 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 the Antichrist but they're going to be two people. And it's also interesting, too, because the, if you remember, I just read about the Jewish 
eschatology is that they were going to have a Messiah and then a, like his son being another Messiah figure, that there's two Messiahs. And the Islam is saying that there's going to be two also, which this might be how the false prophet fits in with the Antichrist, that it might be his son, right? A like a physical son of the Antichrist is that false prophet pointing everybody to the beast, the dragon, right? So, um, and that's how they'll be working together. So one of them will be, according to Islam, will be the second coming of Jesus, which will be the Antichrist claiming to be Jesus. And then the other one will be this Imam Mahdi working together, which will probably be the false prophet. And then it says, um, differences exist in the concept of the Mahdi between Shia Muslims and adherents of the Sunni tradition. For Sunnis, the Mahdi is the Muslim's future leader who is yet to come. For most Shia Muslims, the Mahdi was born but disappeared and will remain hidden from humanity until he reappears to bring justice to the world, a doctrine known as the occultation. Uh, for 12 er Shia, this hidden Imam is Muhammad al-Mahdi, the 12th Imam. Uh, another source here says, in heavy contrast with Shiite Islam, Sunnis have a much more human view of the Mahdi, who they believe will be nothing less than the most rightly guided Muslim of his time. He will be rectified in a single night, which is taken to mean that the provisions for his leadership and rule will be made in a single night. According to Sunan Ibn Majah, one of the six canonical collections of Hadith narrated by Ali, Mahdi is one of us, the people of the household, Allah will rectify him in a single night, whereas much of the Shiite belief ascribes divine faculties. In some circles of Shiite Islam, it is even believed that the Mahdi can mentally control the wind and vegetation by God's permission and transcendent status to the Mahdi. Sunnis believe he will be altogether human, but will have sagacity. Now, sag sagacity is like being like a sage or a magician. And so both of these are basically saying that he's going to have these supernatural abilities and powers, which again, we saw there's going to be lying signs and wonders. So he's created by the Antichrist. Stuff. Again, it fits in perfect. When he comes, he's, he's exactly going to be doing what they're expecting, especially as it pertains to leading other people and ruling a nation. Soon he's believed he will rise and be recognized by his continued philanthropy, charity. Now look at this. Philanthropy, charity, piety, facial features. So if you remember what the Antichrist does, again, described in Daniel, it says that he does something that his fathers didn't do in that he distributes the spoil. He distributes, you know, when, he's win when he's conquering and stuff, he's going to be doing this, this like redistribution of wealth to all the people and, and giving that to them to make them love him even more. And, and I'm sorry, I... I I don't have the reference for that, but it's in Daniel. We covered that when we did a couple weeks ago. You can look it up for yourself in Daniel. I, I don't remember what chapter it's in. Um, so the, Sunnis are, the Sunni Muslims are expecting this, uh, this figure who's going to have philanthropy, charity, piety, facial features, name, and sense of justice, not through direct divine intervention. It says, it is not unreasonable to suspect, based on these narrations, that the Mahdi may not be known to the people immediately, even after being born and living for quite some time without the title of Mahdi. So they're expecting someone that he could be born and just people won't know it yet until he comes on scene. And that's it. I think that's exactly the way it's going to happen with the Antichrist. He's going to be around for a while. And when the Bible talks about him coming into power, they say he's going to come into power through flatteries. He's not going to conquer anything like this. He's going to come in with a small group of people. And he's going to win the kingdom over by flatteries. People aren't going to know who he was in advance but then he's going to come into power and then he's going to be, make himself known. And again, similarities. Jesus Christ didn't really make himself known to the world until he was about 30 years old, right? He grew in the Lord. We don't see anything about any ministry before he's about 30 and then made himself known to the world. The Antichrist will probably be about 30 years old in true form and fashion to just duplicate and counterfeit everything that God has done. The Hindus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna we're, we're almost done here. I only got, I got some, a, a real short section on the Hindus and the Buddhists and, and that's it. But um, the Hindus, it says, it says here, this, this reference that I found says, at this time of evil, the final incarnation of Vishnu, 
known as Kalki, not Kali, Kalki, will appear on a white horse. Well, isn't that something? He's going to appear on a white horse. We know that Jesus is going to come on a white horse when he comes to judge. But you know who's coming on a white horse first? The Antichrist. He will amass an army of those few pious souls remaining. These together with all the incarnations of the Godhead, or avatars, which have appeared throughout human history will destroy all demons and sins in the world. You know who are going to be the demons in the world at this time? It's going to be the believers. The believers in Jesus Christ. We're going to be the ones with the targets on our head to destroy and to wipe out those, those hateful Christians, those intolerant Christians that believe in Jesus Christ. They'll probably have another name for us to dehumanize and to, and to just... just get people, everybody against what we believe. Terrorists. Terrorists, yeah. I mean, you can see the language being manipulated already to try to fit people, you know, these radical, Christian, extremist terrorists that are spreading hate in the world. Judging. I mean, however they do it, you, you could see it. I mean, you could see the attacks coming. You see how things are forming together. And that's going to be us. And people have this figure and they're going to believe the lie. They're going to believe the false, the, the lying signs and wonders because they, they didn't believe the truth. And they're going to be swept away with this nonsense. The Buddhists. So here's, here's what I have for the Buddhists. There will be a new era in which the next Buddha, Maitreya, will appear but it will be preceded by the degeneration of human society. This will be a period of greed, lust, poverty, ill will, violence, murder, impiety, physical weakness, sexual depravity, and societal collapse. And even the Buddha himself will be forgotten. Oh, that's horrible. The Buddha himself? <laughs> What's interesting, though, about the Buddhists is that, like, there's, there's honestly, like, that's probably, from what I read, and I didn't spend tons of time researching this, that was the closest thing I found that's going to match up, because there is. There's going to be a degrading of society. I mean, we're seeing it happening now. There's going to be a lot of violence. There's going to be a lot of turmoil. There's going to be a lot of problems in the world. There'll be wars, rumors of wars. There'll be famines, pestilence, sexual depravity. I mean, all this stuff is going to be happening. That lines up with this. But they believe some crazy things. There's, like, everything's on a cycle of, like, Thou like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of like of repeating with with these various stages and stuff it's it's not going to happen in the time frame that they think it's going to happen because they think we got like 40,000 more years or something of whatever time era epoch we're in right now but again it won't matter when you have the pieces of it there because they'll just say, oh, okay, well, we were wrong about that, but obviously everything else is fitting into the picture. Right. So it's not that hard to swallow that, well, we didn't have all the details, right? Well, we misunderstood something here, but here it all is. All of this said, the whole point is to show you how Satan operates. Because there's a greater theme to learn. It, it's fun looking at prophecy. I, it, I love doing this. I think it's great to just see what's going to happen, just to, just to know what's going to happen. God told us this stuff for a reason. But it also demonstrates really how slick Satan is and all of his devices and, and how well he's able to manipulate people and to get in and to build trust and to get people to, to believe him. And he'll go to great lengths to do that. And that's why, you know, that's why false prophets are described as sheep in, or wolves in sheep's clothing because they are counterfeiting. They are making the outside look like everything you want it to be, but they're con men. And we need to be aware of this in our life in general. When you talk about Bible teachers, people trying to teach you things, I don't care what it is. You need to have really good discernment of good and evil and who you're going to believe and who you're not going to believe. And the only way you can have the discernment is by knowing this book, not just reading it, knowing this book. Reading it over and over and over and over again. So that way when 
You're confronted with, how do I know if what he's saying is true? You have a foundation of truth to compare it against. The people who, who check for counterfeit bills, counterfeit money, you know how they know which ones are counterfeit? Because they study the real thing over and over and over and over again so they know what is real. That way, when something else is put in front of them, they can see, oh, wait, this isn't real. This isn't right because, it's, because I know what the real thing looks like. They don't learn all of the different counterfeits that are out there. They just learn the one true thing. If you know the truth, you got the, you've got the truth and you've got this nailed down, you could spot the counterfeits. And that's, that's what's going to protect you. No matter how sneaky and tricky Satan can be, no matter how many miracles he could perform, this is going to tell you what's true and what's false. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for revealing so much unto us through the book of Revelation and other scripture, dear Lord, where um, you've given us all these prophecies. What an amazing book you've given to us, dear Lord, the word of God. You're an amazing God. You, you've, you fulfill everything that you say, dear Lord, and, and it just comes back with, with just um, precise accuracy. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us enough to give us strength, to give us the... the um, the understanding to give us your words, to give us these prophecies so that we can know what to expect. God, I pray that you please help none of us to be deceived by Satan or by his, uh, his false prophets and his minions, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to study and, and to learn your words so that we can spot the counterfeit a mile away. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.